All right, well, thank you very much for uh, being here th this morning. Um, I'd like to welcome particularly His Worship uh, the Mayor, uh, Bob Parker, uh, and his team, uh, Mark Thielen, uh, and Ethan Stratton. Stetson. Oh, my apologies, I, I really do apologise for that. Uh, and uh, I just want to acknowledge to Tony Marriott, who's uh, uh, been part of the, the considerations over the past uh, uh, you know, long number of weeks. Uh, also, um, uh, the Mayor will speak um, uh, shortly, uh, and after that Roger's going to talk about the communications plan that we have in one or two other matters that will be associated with that. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Dr Jan Kupik um, and Calvin Berryman uh, for the inputs that they've had over this last period of time, and also EQC for uh, their help as well. Uh, it was really in this situation, uh, quite a greenfields experience as far as determining uh, what might happen in the best interest of people who have uh, damaged property and uh, land on those uh, port hills. Um, so I will make a, a, some announcements shortly, but I just want to give you the history. So on the 1st of July 2011, when we were doing those early flat land type uh, announcements, um, <laughs> Much of the Port Hills was zoned Stop white. On the 1st of July 2011, amid the early flatland zoning decisions, um, much of the Port Hills was zoned white. And that indicated simply that there was a range of assessments required to see uh, what the land was. And I want to make it, very, make it very clear that the type of damage that has occurred on the Port Hills is in no way uh, similar to the damage that's occurred on the flat land. Uh, while certainly geologically there might be some similarities, but in the, in the people experience of these things, they are very, very different. On the flat land, you've lost crust, you've lost bearing capacity, and it simply won't come back. Uh, the, the, dif the difference on the Port Hills is that where you have uh, land damage, it's cliff collapse. Uh, where you have uh, life risk, it's both cliff collapse, land slip, and rock roll. So these decisions um, uh, have been pretty difficult. Uh. In uh, the early parts, there was work undertaken by GNS for the Christchurch City Council, quite extensive amount of work. A ground truthing of the GNS results uh, was undertaken by the Port Hills Geotechnical Group for the Christchurch City Council. And a 3D rockfall study was also undertaken for SARA by specialist geotechnical firm Geovert. Between the 5th of September 2011 and the 18th of May 2012, some 11,700 properties were zoned from white to green, leaving around about 1,700 properties still white. 1,558 of those properties are residential dwellings and it's those properties that are most affected by today's decisions. These properties are at some level of risk from either cliff collapse, rock roll, or Lancer. 1,107 of those properties, though, can be zoned green. These present no significant uh, life risk uh, from either cliff, cliff collapse, landslip, or rock roll. They are all in a category that you would say has a risk above 1 in 10,000. Owners of those properties can now start discussions with their insurance companies and EQC. A major challenge throughout this has been determining the appropriate level of risk. I'll talk about the categories of damage and how we've approached the decision making uh, process uh, one by one, starting with cliff collapse followed by rock roll. The GNS study assessed life risk, safety uh, risk I should say, from cliff collapse uh, confirms that there are many properties affected by significant cliff collapse and debris inundation in the Port Hills. Uh, you can see it, it was knowing the extent to which it was having an effect uh, that GNS was able to help clarify. The five worst affected sites are in uh, Redcliffs, Peacock's Gallop, Shag Rock Reserve, Nayland Street, Wakefield Avenue and Richmond Hill and Whitewash Head. Despite the time required to be certain about this decision, the damage is such that decisions can now, now be made confidently. In many cases, no one is living in these areas because it is impossible to do so. Residents have self-evacuated, 
or the houses are already subject to Section 124 notices. Viable remediation options uh, that would stabilise those cliffs or could stabilise uh, those cliffs have not been able to be identified. To give you some important context, some parallels can be drawn between the residential flatland and areas of the Port Hills affected by cliff collapse and are going to be red zoned today. The situation of cliff collapse properties aligns with the criteria developed for residential uh, uh, red zone land, albeit that the uh, technical inputs are somewhat different. There is area-wide damage to the land, uh, thereby requiring some sort of area-wide solution if it were available. And it does mean that that land makes it inappropriate for continued residential occupation. An engineering solution to remediate land and land damage, uh, as was the case in most of the red areas on the flatland, uh, was uncertain in both terms of detailed design, its potential success and its possible com commencement, given the ongoing seismic activity. And it's sort of somewhat uh, ironic that we get a, a reminder that we're still in a seismically active zone as we started the announcement today. Any solutions uh, identified, regardless of cost, would be very disruptive for landowners, as, as uh, a commencement date would be uncertain, thanks to the ongoing events uh, and the need to sequent, sequence major remediation like that. In essence, uh, re major remediation for cliff collapse has not been an option. Um, Um, just trying to brief, make this a little bit briefer, Bob. Um, as with the flatland red zones, uh, we would be talking years before people got back into their houses. Um, further, uh, unlike the flatland, there is the life risk issue associated with <laughs> ongoing occupation of these areas. So today we are announcing uh, the red zoning of 191 residential properties and that red zoning is being applied because of cliff collapse. The owners of these properties will receive offers of purchase. The same two offers as the red zone offers have received uh, will be available, uh, um, but in reality um, uh, no one will be rebuilding on those sites. So if they take option two, it will be to build on some other site. Three of these 191 properties are currently not zoned white, but are in fact zoned green. And I acknowledge that for these property owners, today's decision may come as a shock. But it was not possible to uh, affect a line of safety with those houses included. Five of these properties do not face immediate life risk, but are completely surrounded by properties uh, that do have risks of life associated with them and are therefore being associated red. The geotechnical information now available has allowed assessments of relative life safety risk stemming from the risk of rock roll and future options for the properties. The first step for walking, working through the issues associated with rock roll has been to give due consideration to the level of life safety risk that is considered to be acceptable. As we know from our everyday lives, it's not possible or sensible to entirely eliminate or seek to eliminate risk. In this regard, it's important to note that the risk arising from rock roll is not a constant. GNS has indicated that seismicity risk is expected to diminish over time, which means that risk of rock roll is also expected to diminish over time. There is no correct level of risk, but many people are of the view that risk tolerance of one in 10,000 represents an appropriate risk threshold in the rock roll situation. One in 10,000 is a, a, a risk level for life threat that's used extensively in many situations, uh, both here and uh, around the world. This level is equivalent to the risk of being uh, in a fatal motor accident, and it parallels uh, with some aspects of regulatory practice um, in other parts, as I said, of the world. Properties at risk uh, better than one in 5,000 have been zoned uh, green today, 
on the basis that this is considered to be an acceptable level of risk associated with rockfall. So let's just be very clear about that. Um, uh, the, the, if someone is in a category of one to five, or at one to five thousand today, uh, given the models that uh, have been produced, the expectation is that by 2016 they'd be at uh, one to ten thousand. It may in fact take that long if there was any sort of uh, preventative treatment put in place, and then it would become superfluous to requirement. So it seems sensible for those people to have their zoning uh, turn green. Properties at risk uh, worse than 1 in 10,000 have been zoned red on the basis that this is considered to be an unacceptable risk level for issues associated with rock roll, rock roll and the risk levels are unlikely to ever reach uh, uh, the acceptance criteria. Can I just say, I see 1 in 10,000, 1 in 1,000, 1 in 1,000. A uh, comparatively small number of properties will remain white for a longer period of time. So I think it's 94 properties that are going to be red zoned because of rock roll. Uh, and 158 properties will remain white. Let me just talk for a minute about those 158 properties. Um, they are in a situation where their risk uh, is considered to be greater than one in 5,000. In other words, a lesser number after the one. Uh, but in some cases, they may come up above that very, very quickly. Uh, and so there has to be uh, greater analysis done of uh, the situation for those people. Their land essentially is not damaged. It is life threat and uh, the life threat risk that puts them in a situation of uh, uh, some uncertainty. And so uh, we are asking for another eight weeks to complete the assessment on those 158 properties uh, to make uh, some decisions for them. This is consistent with the process, uh, uh, well, what, what we want is a, a process that's consistent with the wider decision, uh, but focuses down on these uh, groups um, uh, somewhat more specifically. All but eight properties assessed as being at some risk from landslip have also been zoned green. This is consistent with the process and methodology used elsewhere in New Zealand. Further, specific geotechnical investigations are required uh, and will be conducted into eight properties where initial investigations have indicated some risk. So those eight properties will stay um, uh, white as well uh, and we will have a decision for those people um, by the end of October. Uh. Owners of properties red zoned or green zoned now have certainty and can take the next steps, moving through with the Crown Offer process or talking to their insurers and EQC is appropriate. Homeowners of, property, of properties uh, that are still zoned white will have their decision by the 17th of August and those eight properties uh, who are subject to some landslip <coughs> where further investigation is required will have their decision by the end of October. Uh, Section 124 notices prohibit access and those notices will be placed on some Port Hills properties by the Christchurch City Council, but I'll leave uh, that for the Mayor to explain what that is. All I'll say is this, there will be some properties that have gone red today that don't have Section 124 notices on them. They won't have that notice because they're further down the hill and they were being protected by the houses above. But as soon as those houses above go, they fall into that 124 category. So it's sort of like, uh, uh, um, you know, skittles in a way, when one falls, they all start to fall. And it's very, very hard, it's been very, very difficult, uh, but there it is. So a large number of houses going green, properties going green, uh, a smaller number going red, and an even smaller number staying white in the meantime. Can I just uh, conclude before the Mayor speaks, saying that uh, this has been a um, very, very collaborative process over a long period of time. Uh, and it's been uh, very, very, I think, good that we have been able to call on uh, such considerable local expertise uh, that can be uh, very confidently and has been very confidently and competently re uh, peer reviewed uh, by others uh, to give us the, the uh, confidence that we are on the right track. 
Um, you know, in the end, in these situations, you make assessments about risk and you make choices about risk, but you need to do that on the basis of some very well-informed uh, uh, science, basically. And uh, I want to again thank Kelvin and uh, um, Ethan and Jan for the work that they've done and giving the rest of us a degree of confidence. In a policy sense too, you have to look at what this means not only for the city and for the individuals uh, who are the homeowners, but also for the possibility of precedent being set across the country. And I want to acknowledge Mike Thielen for his work in a policy sense, uh, Benicia Smith and her team uh, uh, for the work that they have done as well. Um, and uh, you know, all of this has come together in a, a, a sort of a um, interesting sort of way because we were constantly getting uh, you know bits and pieces coming that. Um, you know, were, were refinements of previous bits of, uh, of information. So uh, it's been a very big effort and I wouldn't want anyone to think that um, uh, the decisions that have been made today have been uh, made in any way that's sort of uh, trite and ill-considered, far from it. We know how serious it is for people to receive these decisions. But it also marks, I think, a significant step forward for the wider city because it means that we now have only a very few number of our residential properties uh, with uh, some uncertainty about their future. So thank you for your uh, patience. I'll ask the Mayor to make a few comments and to just maybe run through that section 124 process and the Council decision around the uh, 1 to 5,000 and above. Well, um, um, thank you very much indeed, Minister. And I, and I think that um, you know, that little earthquake before just reminds us that although we are now in a profile which is all heading in that right direction and, and tracking pretty much as expected, uh, it, I guess, explains the considerable tension that surrounds making these decisions because it is, at the end of the day, about life risk. It is about people. And uh, today, Minister, we've been able to give a lot of clarity to a huge number of people who have been in an invidious situation and uh, it is not because of lack of desire to make that uh, decision it's just been an enormously complicated decision i'd have to say the last two or three weeks in particular uh, have been hugely uh, detailed and pressurized and difficult we've had gns uh, we've had eqc we've had engineers from sarah and from the city there are the policy implications as well. There's a raft of issues that have to be considered. But at the end of the day, it is all about our people. And I'm really pleased that so many of the people of the city today have got clarity. Uh, for those of you who have probably not got the news that you wanted, that uh, your property has gone red, uh, you know, our, our thoughts are very much with you. We just know uh, how difficult it is for you. And all of the services that we can provide as a city, as Sarah, uh, are there to support you. But on the uh, section uh, 124s in particular, there's just some very simple things to remember there. A section 124 is a notice that a council will put on a property which is deemed to be uninhabitable. And there are two broad reasons for that. One of them is because there are geotechnical issues. Obviously, in this case, we've had a really good description of what they could be. But also, in some cases, there will be uh, a structural reason, something inherent in the building itself as a result of the, in this case, earthquake activity, which means that you simply can't live in it. It represents too much of uh, a risk. So uh, for those people in the uh, white zone that have now been given a SERA zoning, essentially that SERA zoning overrides the section 124s. So if you're in a green zone, uh, you were previously white, uh, but in the last few minutes you've been determined as to be in a green zone, then the section 124 that is on your house for a geotechnical reason has essentially been lifted. And we'll be contacting uh, those owners ourselves in order to ensure that they understand uh, what that means. If you've gone into uh, a red zone from uh, white and uh, you had a 124, well, in, in essence, that 124 has essentially been overridden now by the uh, Greater Sierra Zoning, and uh, we'll be discussing uh, that by contacting those owners as well, again, just to ensure that you completely understand the situation that you find yourselves in. 
Uh, around the uh, rest of the uh, Peninsula Hills area, which are now, of course, uh, the areas that were zoned green before, there are some existing Section 124s. So if you were already green prior to today and you had a Section 124 on your house, that still remains. That doesn't change, and that's because there is a localised risk in your area. You'll be aware of that, but we just want to make that really clear. Most yeah. likely a building. Most likely a building, but uh, generally speaking, uh, you're not going to be uh, changing those in the short term. But again, just so you know, I want to reiterate that we continuously are re-evaluating the Section 124s. So usually uh, on average every four to six weeks, we go in and re-evaluate the Section 124s. So in broad terms, um, good news for many people, real clarity for everyone who became either green or red today, but uh, our thoughts are with those people in the white zone in particular. Uh, for you, uh, it does mean, as the Minister said, probably another six to eight weeks uh, of waiting. And that's not being done because uh, the bureaucrats somewhere are tangled up or gone on holiday or too busy or whatever. It is because we're absolutely focusing on these areas. Uh, and it, there is a life risk and we want to go back and make sure that we've got the numbers and the uh, geotechnical issues around those properties. It's a much more detailed job now and that will take a bit more time. It has to be done well because at the end of the day we are talking about human lives and the safety of our people. So thank you. Thank you uh, for all the work. I've got to say to all the staff and all the folk that have been involved in this, uh, it's just been uh, the most complicated thing I think that I've been involved with around the earthquake in terms of resolving risk and resolving these issues. It's been a difficult job. I think um, Bob's explanations around the 124s are uh, just further served to show one of the complexities that we've got. So, you know, you've got houses that were 124'd because of uh, life threat uh, and may not have had a lot of damage. You've got other houses that are 124 because they are just so badly broken up uh, it's not advisable for people to go occupying them. Could I just make uh, two further, uh, one further uh, uh, comment and that is that uh, for some of the people who are um, having to move out of red zones, if they have um, not been accessing a uh, government accommodation assistance up to this point, um, then I will be taking a, a note to Cabinet uh, in the next uh, fortnight. Uh, it currently expires, that, that offer expires in February. Uh, we'll be reviewing that to see what the needs are and quite clearly these people will have, um, some of those people will have a need that uh, goes beyond that uh, particular date. This one, I can't make an announcement about what will happen, but I'm just saying it's something we acknowledge, uh, and we've got time on our side to uh, to look at it. Uh, the last comment I make is that it would have been fascinating, I think, for many people if um, we could have had some uh, video footage, perhaps, Bob, of uh, you and I chairing meetings both here and in Wellington, uh, trying to pull all this stuff together. Uh, where you know, I think the the uh, passion that was in the room was was quite extraordinary and the, the will to do the right thing by people, um, you know, very much to the fore. Uh, and we had uh, also a number of other agencies of state, um, uh, Treasury was certainly part of that as well and it was a very, very people focused process. Um, so to those who are white today, I just do want to say it's, uh, we're not trying to prolong your pain or the agony, we just want to make sure that you do get uh, a fair go because the situation for you is not as clear as it's been in any of the other land decisions, and even those difficult ones that we've had to make today. Roger, uh, you're going to make yeah, a few comments? Yeah. So you're know, just reiterating what the Minister said, this is going to be a very difficult time for a lot of people. Um, we're fully aware that for a lot of these people it's almost you know, a life-changing thing. Um, and it's important for those people who are finding life really tough at the moment, they do seek out the appropriate support services, um, both from ourselves and the other agencies we work with, but also neighbours and friends look after those people as well. Um, you know, I actually agree with the Minister, the people who have stayed white are going to find this really difficult. I've had a lot to do with a lot of these people on the Port Hills who've got these rock roll issues who, who want um, decisions fast. Um, we'll be visiting those people, except for those people that have got um, Section 124 notices on their houses, but everyone else who's white will be getting a visit um, today or tomorrow by um, an e a, uh, a Sarah Earthquake Support Coordinator, supported by the Red Cross and the Salvation Army. 
Um, those, those, just for you, know, people who have got a Section 124, we're not going to be asking people to visit them and talk to those people for those people who are still living in their Section 124 houses. Um, we'll get a letter to the people um, as quickly as possible to people in all the categories. They'll be going out, I think they'll be going out today, um, and they'll be going out. The people with the Section 124 uh, complications that the, the Mayor talked about, they'll be being personally contacted by the City Council um, as soon as, as possible. Um, the Sarah um, call centre number's up there, 0800 ring Sarah. Um, they can ring us, and or 0800 Sarah. I think it's 0800 ring Sarah though, isn't it? So they need to ring, they can ring that number and they'll be, we can give them some advice, but more importantly we can put in touch with other people that can actually give them, give them the, the support um, they need. Um, our website is, um, is up with this information. Our website is running at the moment. Um, so no one's giving me nods from the back of the room. Um, but that, that does have a link through the Landcheck website as well. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Um, I'll be meeting later on today with the Port Hills um, Strategy Group, which is a group of people that represent various residents group on the Port Hills, talking about what's next. Um, and then next week we'll have a series of community meetings um, with people just to explain these, these events further. For people in the wide area, we'll be making sure we really do get to those people because we know there's going to be a lot of frustration from those people. But we've done our very, very best to get to a decision. It frustrates me a lot that we haven't got, we, we're not there yet.